salvation, for the victory of our mighty King. Rejoice and sing now all around earth, bright with a glorious splendor, for darkness has been vanquished by our eternal King. Rejoice and be glad now, Mother Church, and let your holy courts in radiant light resound with the praises of your people. All you who stand near this marvelous and holy flame, pray with me to God the Almighty for the grace to sing the worthy praise of this great light. Through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with God in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and good always and everywhere. With our whole heart and mind and voice to praise you, the invisible, almighty, and eternal God, and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who at the feast of the Passover paid for us the debt of Adam's sin, and by his blood delivered your faithful people. This is the day when you brought our ancestors, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt, and led them through the Red Sea on dry land. This is the day when all who believe in Christ are delivered from the gloom of sin and are restored to grace and holiness of life. This is the night when Christ broke the bonds of death and hell and rose victorious from the grave. Ah, wonderful and beyond our knowing, O oh God, is your mercy and loving kindness to us that to redeem us lay you gave a son. Ah, holy is this day when wickedness is put to flight and sin is washed away. It restores innocence to the fallen and joy to those who mourn. It casts out pride and hatred and brings peace and comfort. Ah, blessed is this day when earth and heaven are joined and we are reconciled to God. Holy God, accept our evening sacrifice, the offering of this candle in your honor. This lacks the work of peace. 
God, you are the creator of the world, the liberator of your people, and the wisdom of the earth. By the resurrection of your son, free us from our fears, restore us in your image, and guide us with your light. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear the great salvation story. Especially now, we long for an ordered world. In spite of death and sorrow, the resurrection of Jesus Christ contains the promise of a new creation. Baptized into his death and resurrection, we are made witness to God's new creation, and it is very good. A reading from Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but the earth became chaos and emptiness, and darkness came over the face of the deep. Yet the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Light, be! And light was. God saw that light was good, and God separated light from darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. Evening came, and morning followed, the first day. Then God said, Now make an expanse between the waters. Separate water from water. So it was. God made the expanse and separated the water above the expanse from the water below it. God called the expanse sky. Evening came, and morning followed, the second day. Then God said, Waters under the sky be gathered into one place, dry ground, up here. So it was. God called the dry ground earth, and the gathering of the waters sea. And God saw that this was good. Then God said, Earth produce vegetation plants that scatter their own seeds, and every kind of fruit tree that bears fruit with its own seed in it. So it was. The earth brought forth every kind of plant that bears seed, and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And God saw that this was good. Evening came, and morning followed. The third day. Then God said, Now, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky, separate day from night. Let them mark the signs and seasons, days and years, and serve as luminaries in the sky, shedding light on the earth. So it was. God made two great lights, the greater one to illumine the day and the lesser to illumine the night. And God made the stars as well, placing them in the expanse of the sky to shed light on the earth, to govern both day and night and separate light from darkness. And God saw that this was good. Evening came, and morning followed, the fourth day. God then said, Waters, swarm with abundance of living beings. Birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the sky. And so it was. God created great sea monsters and all sorts of swimming creatures with which the waters are filled, and all kinds of birds. God saw that this was good, and blessed them, saying, Bear fruit, increase your numbers, and fill the waters of the seas. Birds abound on the earth. Evening came, and morning followed. The fifth day. Then God said, Earth, bring forth all kinds of living souls, cattle, things that crawl and wild animals of all kinds. So it was. God made all kinds of wild animals and cattle and everything that crawls on the ground. And God saw that this was good. And God said, Let us make humankind in our image to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals, and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created as God's reflection. In the divine image, God created them, female and male. 
God made them. God blessed them and said, bear fruit, increase your numbers and fill the earth and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things on the earth. God then told them, look, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit carries its seed inside itself. They will be your food, and to all the animals of the earth and the birds of the air and the things that crawl on the ground, everything that has a living soul in it, I give all the green plants for food. So it was. God looked at all of this creation and proclaimed that it was good, very good. Evening came and morning followed, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. On the seventh day, God had finished all the work of creation, and so on that seventh day, God rested. God blessed the seventh day and called it sacred, because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. These are the generations of the heavens of the earth when they were created. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. We long for freedom from fear and confusion, sin and death. The resurrection of Christ brings us through the sea to new life, and baptism has enacted that exodus. A reading from Exodus. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back and saw the Egyptians pursuing them and cried out in terror to God. They turned on Moses, asking, were there no graves in Egypt that you must lead us out to die in the desert? What have you done to us? Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better to work for the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Stand your ground and you will see the victory Yahweh will win for you today. Though you see Egypt today, you will never see it again. Yahweh will do the fighting for you. You only have to keep still. Then Yahweh said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to march on and you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and split the sea in two that the Israelites may pass through it on dry land. I will make the hearts of the Egyptians so stubborn that they will come in after you. And I will glorify myself at the expense of Pharaoh and all the army, chariots and charioteers. They will know that I am Yahweh when I glorify myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and charioteers. Then the angel of God who was leading the Israelites moved to their rear. The pillar of cloud left the front of their number and took up a position behind them between the Israelites and the Egyptians. All during the night, the cloud provided light on the one side and darkness to the other side, so that there was no contact between them. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh swept the sea with a strong east wind throughout the night, and so it turned into dry land. When the water was thus divided, the Israelites marched into the midst of the sea on dry land, with the water walled up on their right and on their left. The Egyptians followed in pursuit. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and charioteers went after them into the midst of the sea. At dawn, Yahweh looked down upon the Egyptian forces from the column of fiery cloud and threw the army into confusion and panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they could hardly turn. The Egyptians turned to flee from the Israelites saying, their God fights for them against us. Then. Yahweh told Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and let the water flow back upon the Egyptians, over their chariots and their charioteers. So at sunrise, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the waters rolled back in. As the Egyptians fled, Yahweh hurled them into its midst. And as the water flowed back, covering the chariot charioteers, Pharaoh's whole army, who had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites passed through, walking dry shod into the sea with the water like a wall on their right and on their left. Thus, 
Yahweh saved Israel on that day from the power of Egypt. When Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore and beheld the great power that Yahweh had shown against them, the people held Yahweh in awe and put their faith in Yahweh and in Moses, God's trusted servant. Then Aaron's sister, the prophet Miriam, picked up a tambourine and all the women followed her dancing with tambourines while Miriam sang, sing to Yahweh who has triumphed gloriously, who has flung horse and rider into the sea. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. We long for freedom from fear and confusion, sin and death. The resurrection of Christ brings us through the sea to new life, and baptism has enacted that exodus. A reading from Exodus. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back and saw the Egyptians pursuing them and cried out in terror to God. They turned on Moses asking, were there no graves in Egypt that you must lead us out to die in the desert? What have you done to us? Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Didn't we tell you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better to work for the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. But Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Stand your ground and you will see the victory Yahweh will win for you today. Though you see Egypt today, you will never see it again. Yahweh will do the fighting for you. You only have to keep still. Then Yahweh said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to march on and you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and split the sea in two that the Israelites may pass through it on dry land. I will make the hearts of the Egyptians so stubborn that they will come in after you. And I will glorify myself at the expense of Pharaoh and all the army, chariots and charioteers. They will know that I am Yahweh when I glorify myself over Pharaoh and his chariots and charioteers. Then the angel of God, who was leading the Israelites, moved to their rear. The pillar of cloud left the front of their number and took up a position behind them, between the Israelites and the Egyptians. All during the night, the cloud provided light on the one side and darkness to the other side, so that there was no contact between them. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And Yahweh swept the sea with a strong east wind throughout the night, and so it turned into dry land. When the water was thus divided, the Israelites marched into the midst of the sea on dry land, with the water walled up on their right and on their left. The Egyptians followed in pursuit. All Pharaoh's horses and chariots and charioteers went after them into the midst of the sea. At dawn, Yahweh looked down upon the Egyptian forces from the column of fiery cloud and threw the army into confusion and panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they could hardly turn. The Egyptians turned to flee from the Israelites, saying, their God fights for them against us. Then Yahweh told Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea and let the water flow back upon the Egyptians, over their chariots and their charioteers. So at sunrise, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the waters rolled back in. As the Egyptians fled, Yahweh hurled them into its midst. And as the water flowed back, covering the chariot charioteers, Pharaoh's whole army, who had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites passed through, walking dry shod into the sea, with the water like a wall on their right and on their left. Thus, Yahweh saved Israel on that day from the power of Egypt. When Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore and beheld the great power that Yahweh had shown against them, the people held Yahweh in awe and put their faith in Yahweh and in Moses, God's trusted servant. Then Aaron's sister, the prophet Miriam, picked up a tambourine and all the women followed her dancing with tambourines while Miriam sang, sing to Yahweh who has triumphed gloriously, who has flung horse and rider into the sea. Hear what the spirit is saying to God's people.
We are the dry bones. The spirit of God poured out from Christ's death and resurrection makes us alive together with him, a whole people standing together in new life, even when we are separated from each other. A reading from Ezekiel. The hand of Yahweh was upon me and it carried me away by the spirit of Yahweh and set me down in a valley, a valley full of bones. God made me walk up and down among them and I saw that there was a vast number of bones lying there in the valley and they were very dry. God asked me, mere mortal, can these bones live? I answered, only you know that sovereign Yahweh. And God said, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of Yahweh. Sovereign Yahweh says to these bones, I am going to breathe life into you. I will fasten sinews on you, clothe you with flesh, cover you with skin and give you breath. And you will live and you will know that I am sovereign Yahweh. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to matching bone. As I watched, sinews appeared on them, flesh clothed them and skin covered them but there was no breath in them. Then God said to me, prophesy to the wind, prophesy mere mortal and say to it, thus says sovereign Yahweh, approach from the four winds breath and breathe on these slain that they may live. I prophesied as I was commanded and breath came into them. They came alive and stood up on their feet, a vast multitude. Then God said to me, mere mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. The people keep saying, our bones are dry, our hope is gone, and we are doomed. Prophesy, therefore, and say to them, thus says sovereign Yahweh, I am going to open your graves and raise you up from the dead, my people. I will return you to the land of Israel. When I open your graves and raise you up, you, my people, will know that I am Yahweh. Then I will put my spirit into you, and you will return to life, and I will settle you back on your own land. Then you will know that I, Yahweh, have spoken and made all this happen, says Sovereign Yahweh. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. We have often run away from our vocation as witnesses to new life, hope, and forgiveness in Christ. His resurrection, like Jonah coming out of the fish after three days, and our baptism into that resurrection, making us like Jonah, restores us to that vocation. A reading from the book of Jonah. The word of Yahweh came to Jonah ben Amittai. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh right now. Raise a cry against it. Tell them that I know all about their crimes. But Jonah decided to run away from Yahweh and set out for Tarshish instead. He went down to Joppa and found a ship bound for Tarshish. He paid the fare and boarded the ship bound for Tarshish in order to get away from Yahweh. But Yahweh unleashed a violent wind on the sea and the storm was so great that it threatened to break up the ship. The frightened sailors, every one of them, appealed to their gods. Then they threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Jonah, however, went below, laid down in the hold, and fell fast asleep. The captain found Jonah and said, how can you sleep at a time like this? Get up, call on your God. Maybe your God will spare a thought for us and not leave us to die. The crew, meanwhile, said to one another, come on, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for bringing this evil on us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell to Jonah. So they said to him, you have brought all this misfortune on us. Tell us, what is your business? Where do you come from? What is your country? What is your nationality? Jonah said, I am a Hebrew, and I worship Yahweh, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The sailors were seized with terror at this and said, what have you done? They learned that Jonah was trying to escape from Yahweh. He told them the whole story. Then they said, what are we going to do with you to make the sea grow calm for us? For the sea was growing rougher and rougher. 
Jonah replied, take me and throw me into the sea, and then it will grow calm for you. For I can see it is my fault this violent storm happened to you. The sailors rowed vainly in an effort to reach the shore, but the sea grew still rougher for them. Then they called on Yahweh and said, please, O Yahweh, don't let us perish for taking this person's life. Don't hold us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Yahweh, acted as you have thought right. And taking hold of Jonah, they threw him into the sea, and the sea grew calm once more. At this, the sailors were seized with dread of Yahweh. They offered a sacrifice to Yahweh and made their vows. Then Yahweh sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and they remained in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. In this difficult time, we are in the fire, but the crucified and risen Christ is with us in the fire and we are saved. And Nebuchadnezzar, once again, does not get it. No one is to be torn limb from limb. God's mercy is for all. A reading from the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar ordered a gold image to be built, 90 feet high and nine feet wide, and had it set up on the plain of Dura in Babylon. He then ordered all the nobility, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to assemble for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And the nobility, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials took their place in front of the image. Then the herald proclaimed in a loud voice, this is the command for all peoples of every nation and tongue. As soon as you hear the sound of the royal orchestra, you must fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. When they heard the sound of the royal orchestra playing, all the peoples of every nation and tongue fell down and worshipped the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the Chaldeans came forward to inform upon those who were worshipping Yahweh. They told Nebuchadnezzar, Great ruler, you have decreed that everyone fall down and worship the image of gold at the sound of the orchestra, and that whoever does not do this will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some who you have set over the affairs of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have ignored your order. Great ruler, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you set up. Nebuchadnezzar fell into a rage and summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were brought before the ruler, Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you have refused to serve my gods or worship the image of gold I set up? Now when you hear the royal orchestra play its music, if you are prepared to fall down and worship the image I have made, I'll give you another chance. But if you continue to refuse, I'll have you thrown into the blazing furnace immediately. No god will be able to rescue you from my hand. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to Nebuchadnezzar, Great ruler, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If you throw us into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to overcome the blaze and rescue us from your hand. But even if God does not rescue us, we want you to know, great ruler, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you set up. Nebuchadnezzar fumed in anger at what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had told him, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded several of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them in the blazing furnace. Wearing their trousers, shirts, headdresses, and other clothes, they were tied up and thrown into the furnace. Because Nebuchadnezzar's order was so urgent and the fire was so hot, 
Those who were carrying the three of them were killed as they approached the flames, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell headlong into the blazing furnace. They walked straight into the flames, blessing and singing to Yahweh. In the middle of the fire, Azariah stood and prayed, Blessed are you and worthy of praise, our sovereign God of our forebears. Glory to your name forever, for your justice is clear in everything you do. You always keep your promises, your ways are true, and all your judgments are right. In everything you have brought upon us, and upon Jerusalem, the holy city of our forebears, your sentence has been just, since it was because of our sins that you treated us this way. We got just what we deserved. We sinned and betrayed you when we deserted you. We've done every kind of evil. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
I invite you now to stand in body or spirit for the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. And now we will join together in the great Alleluia of Easter. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Alleluia! 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 He is risen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Alleluia, 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 Christ is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. 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 Christ is risen. Alleluia. He is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. (laughs) Alleluia. He is risen. Happy Easter. Alleluia. 
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. Hallelujah. Christ, Christ is has risen. risen. All right. Ready? I'm going to count to three. One, two, two three. three. Hallelujah. 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 I speak to you in the name of one God, holy and undivided Trinity. Please be seated. One of the truly disconcerting things that can happen in the wake of the death of a loved one is that out of the blue, wandering down a street here in Philadelphia, or in the middle of a crowded store, or walking into a movie theater, you suddenly think, you have seen that person. This happened to me most distinctly about a year after my father died. I was walking through my neighborhood, a walk he and I had taken many times together. And off in the distance, I was sure I saw him. My heart beat a little faster as my mind tried to process what I was seeing. And I raced to catch up with him. As I got closer, I saw, of course, that it was not him. It was another silver-haired, very short man. But for one instant, I caught a glimpse, a glimmer of him in a familiar place. And I felt both that old pain of loss mixed with a little rejoicing in the illusion in the kind gift of memory the gift of a trick of the mind that briefly gives you your loved one back in an old, familiar place. And so it goes. We love, we lose, and we may wonder if love is forever. The Reverend Martha Stern tells the story of beginning preparations for her garden early one spring. She went to the garden department of the nearest Lowe's to smell the dirt and see the flowers and watch people fill up those really handy little trolleys with all sorts of plants. There were people of all ages, couples, families with small children, senior citizens, all breathing in the smell of dirt and flowers and welcoming the riot of colors before them. And suddenly the air was pierced with a woman bellowing, where is it? Where is the Easter stuff? Well, the church politely told her that it was in the main store, and the woman took off in pursuit of the Easter stuff, in something of a huff. Stern writes, quote, I thought, honey, I don't think the Easter stuff is at Lowe's or Walmart or any other store either, end quote. And I, who have a reputation of being something of an Easter Grinch, of getting pretty frustrated with the secularization and trivialization of Easter, agree with her wholeheartedly. The Easter stuff is not on any store shelf. But where then is it? Where is it once you get beyond dying eggs and chocolate bunnies? Where is it once your heart has been broken, once you have loved 
and lost and been bereft. Where is the Easter stuff then? Is the Easter stuff a trick of the mind designed to comfort and soothe us, a kindly little white lie? Mary, who we heard about in the gospel this morning, had her heart broken by the crucifixion. She had stood and watched Jesus, watched love die, and then watched his body placed in a cold, dark tomb and sealed in for eternity. They knew love would never, ever be the same again. They knew they couldn't go back to where they were before and go on with business as usual. They had to go to the tomb that morning because they had to face the truth. They had to face his death. The truth that Mary and the others thought they would face that morning was finality and loss and decay and the death of all that matters about love. For these truths, for these truths, they came prepared. They had spices and linens and dignity and stoic faces with stiff upper lips and everything they needed in the presence of loss. They were ready to care for dead love, to make its death as dignified as possible. And maybe, maybe because they were willing to face the loss, the death of love, because they risked coming face to face with it, what did they find? Not dead love. The tomb was empty and they were all stumped. And I can imagine that this felt like the final insult. It wasn't enough that he was beaten, crucified, and dead, but to come to anoint his body and find it gone, to imagine the dead body of love stolen by grave robbers thrown in a ditch rather than mourned and buried, that was just too much. To imagine that the enemies of love and I would not worry too much about figuring out who the enemies were and are because they live in pretty much every human heart, to imagine that the enemies of love had won again. That, that would be just too much to bear. But the truth is that for anyone who has endured the pain of loving and losing and grieving to the very bone, to anyone who has known this, this is not story. It is part of the human condition, as close to us as breathing. We are always losing love, saying goodbye to love, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And what we try to do in the face of love and loss is to make our goodbyes as dignified as possible. Mary and the other women at the tomb were doing just that, trying to do the best they could under the circumstances of being mortal. They went to the tomb, and their best hope was to say goodbye completely, fully, and deeply to love. But the stone was rolled away, and the tomb was empty, and the dead body of love was gone. And that is the truth at the very heart of our faith. And that is the wonder, the miracle, the joy and the beauty by Christ, in Christ, and through Christ, our last best hope is not, in fact, a dignified goodbye. Our last best hope is that the tomb was empty, that love meets death and wins. Not surprisingly, Mary and the other disciples could not figure it out at first. They were stopped dead in their tracks. They had no idea what had happened. They just had to wait there and see what would happen next. And true to form, for God, what happens next is an angel. God sent Mary angels to help her remember the Easter stuff. Jesus had, of course, told of the Easter stuff before, but in the disciples' grief and trauma, they had forgotten or they hadn't really believed. But the angel helped Mary remember what would happen and helped Mary remember that love would last, not just last, 
not just endure, but that love would triumph, that the Easter stuff is the stuff of triumph. And the angel told her to remember all of this and go and tell the others, which at least the way the story is told by Mark, they were too scared to do. But they must have finally calmed down enough to tell someone because Mark knew the story enough to put pen to papyrus. So this is our part. We have heard the Easter stuff because the angel told Mary and Mary told her friends, the other disciples, and they told their friends, and the Easter stuff kept getting told and retold, remembered and re-remembered from one generation to the next. So now it is our turn. We get to live in, out of, and through the real Easter stuff, eternal love. We get to be the Easter stuff for each other and for a world desperately in need of healing and resurrection. Now we get to be the ones to help each other remember and trust that love never actually ends, that at the end of our days it will not be a trick and it won't just be a glimpse here or an illusion there, a kindly trick of memory. The Easter stuff will fill our souls and we will live in love and with love and through love with all we mourn, made new, raised up, brought into fullness, brought into perfection, brought into eternity. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen. Amen.
I invite you now to stand as we join together in renewing our baptismal vows. Dear friends, we are buried with Christ by baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life. Let us now renew the solemn promises and vows of holy baptism by which we once renounced Satan and all his works and promised to serve God faithfully in this holy Catholic Church. Do you reaffirm your renunciation of evil and renew your commitment to Jesus Christ? I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? I will with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord? I will with God's help. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? I will with God's help. Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? I will, with God's help. Will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? I will, with God's help. May Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and bestowed upon us the forgiveness of sins, keep us in eternal life by his grace. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
On this most holy day, we pray for the church, the earth, the world, those in need, and all the members of God's family, responding to each petition with the words, Hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for all the churches around the globe, for their people and leaders, for the newly baptized, for the believers who cannot assemble for worship in person, for faithful endurance during this time of sorrow and distress, and for a deepening sense of your presence among us. O God, you are our temple in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for the well-being of creation, for the health of seas and rivers and lakes, and for the will to care for your earth. O God, you are our rainbow of promise. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O God, for peace and justice in the world, for an end to war and international turmoil, for concord in our troubled society, for the heads of state, legislators, and local civic leaders, that they enact wise procedures to deal with the coronavirus and other acts that keep us apart and oppressed. O oh God, you are our mighty fortress. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for all who are facing the coronavirus, for all who mourn their dead, all who have contracted the virus, those who quarantine or are stranded away from home, those who have lost their employment, those who fear the present and the future. We pray for physicians, nurses, home health aides, medical researchers, and the World Health Organization. Fill the aching in our hearts with your merciful power. O oh God, you are our everlasting arms. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, God, for all in need, for those suffering for the faith, for those who are poor, who are hungry, who are experiencing homelessness, for those who are sick and those awaiting death and for those we name before you here. Pray for healing for Judith and Joe, for Pat and Katie. O oh God, you are the healer of our every ill. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, for the desires of our hearts. Pray for an end to white supremacy and the courage and follow through to do my part. God, we desire an end to gun violence and the legislation to make that a reality. Give thanks for the people of St. Peter's. O oh God, you are our heart's desire. 
in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our thanks for all who died in the faith and bring us at the final resurrection into your everlasting life where sorrows will be no more. We remember all those who have died over this last year from COVID-19. The victims of gun violence in Atlanta and Boulder. O oh God, our beginning and our end, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your gracious and mighty hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. My siblings in Christ, the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Let us greet one another with a sign of God's peace. Good morning, happy Easter to everyone. Uh, Sarah and I are delighted that you are here with us this morning virtually for our Easter service. It's a real pleasure to have you here. If this is your first time at St. Peter's, I offer a special welcome to you, and I encourage you to fill out one of the um, welcome cards that should be appearing in the chat on this live stream so that we can get to know each other a little better. Um, I really only have a couple of other announcements. First is that uh, this week there are two things going on. One is a return to a rhythm, and for Sarah and for me, uh, stepping back from a rhythm. So the return to the rhythm is we'll go back to our usual cycle of daily prayer. That's Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday morning prayer at 8.30 on Facebook, and um, evening prayer at 5 p.m. on Wednesday on Facebook. Next week, both Sarah and I will be um, away, taking a little bit of time off to uh, replenish our well after this season of Lent and Holy Week and Easter. Um, you will be taken care of. There is always a priest on call. Uh, Dick Ullman will be preaching next Sunday, so huge thank you to Dick for doing that. Um, and then Sarah and I will be back the following week. So again, I'm really delighted that you're here. And happy Easter.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is a right and good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation and the calling of Israel to be your people and your word spoken through the prophets and above all, in the Word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, remember me. Therefore, according to his command, O God, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Peter, our patron, Mary, the mother of God, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him, and with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. In union, blessed Jesus, with a faithful gathered at every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are offered this day, I long to offer your praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until, by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom and an ending peace. Amen. Let us pray. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen.
are looking for a blessing, do not linger here. Here is only emptiness, a hollow, a husk where a blessing used to be. This blessing was not content in its confinement. It could not abide its isolation, the unrelenting silence, the pressing stench of death. So if it is a blessing you seek, open your own mouth. Fill your lungs with the air this new morning brings, and then release it with a cry. Hear how the blessing breaks forth in your own voice, how your own lips form every word you never dreamed to say. See how the blessing circles back again, wanting you to repeat it, but louder how it draws you, pulls you, sends you to proclaim its only word, risen, risen, risen. And the blessing of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go in peace, y'all. <laughs> Alleluia. <laughs>